So, um, yeah, hi. My name is Sva, and this is uh, Christian and Torsten. Uh, they'll be doing the workshop on Sunday, and Torsten also is going to show us the demo afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I want to tell you about Taller, which uses a lot of crypto, but it's not yet another cryptocurrency, but digital cash made socially responsible because it's anonymous for the customer, um, but the merchant can hand out a normal invoice. Um, also, it's fast, convenient, and free as in freedom. So another tagline is independent one-click cash payments. Tala is an acronym that means taxable, anonymous, libre, electronic reserve. So generally, in every aspect, Tala is just like cash. So here's an overview of what I'm presenting now. So I first give an intro. Um, telling a bit about credit cards, cash, and uh, Bitcoin. Uh, then what is Tala and how does it work? Then Tala is seen by a customer, a merchant, government, and technologist. Uh, then I uh, briefly scroll through the crypto protocol, and then I have this part which I called the Tala seen by a futurologist uh, through a crystal ball. <laughs> um, so there I'm trying to tell you about possible feature, features um, and also I would like to have you thinking about this, what every technology should be thinking about um, and check if there's anything about Taller that could be used against us. So as usual we're trying to solve a problem um, but maybe we are overlooking something and uh, because if this works this is going to change something. Um, so yeah, first of all, a question. Uh, RAND is this American think tank uh, back in the old days. Uh, 1971 it was asked, suppose you were an advisor to the head of the KGP, the Soviet secret police. Suppose you are given the assignment of designing a system for the surveillance of all citizens and visitors within the boundaries of the USSR. The system is not to be too ob obtrusive or obvious. What would be your decision? Anyone has a clue? So the answer was credit card payments. So uh, credit card payments are way too transparent. Um, credit card payments only serve an olig oligopoly of a few big foreign companies. It has high fees and is inconvenient, especially for small and frequent online transactions, like having this two-factor authentication, typing a number from your mobile phone. Um, and then it also has too many false positives on fraud detection. As uh, some of you might know, I'm traveling around a lot. So um, actually, I never possessed any credit card that was expiring because at one point, it was just not working anymore, and I got the message that there was any false positive in the fraud detection. So they uh, deleted my credit card and gave me a new one. Um, so I'm uh, very much a person who's <laughs> getting all these false fraud detections. Um, so, but then I'm also like, I'm, I'm barely using my credit card. I use cash anyway, right? So cash also just has a virtual value. Um, it's just there because someone has said so, and everyone believes it. Um, that's how the system works. Um, so in that example, this is uh, rupees from India. Uh, this guy, Mr. Modi from the government of India, said that this money has that amount. So and then on November 8 in 2016, uh, the government of India, in form of Mr. Modi, announced that the, the demonetization of the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. So um, that was 86% of all rupees existing in cash. So um, that happened in the evening um, of the Trump election. So don't wonder if you haven't heard about it, because that was very uh, well thought of them. Um, and uh, it was uh, valid from midnight onwards. So cash can disappear and get invalid even overnight. Um, 
So what happened then in India is that all the ATMs were out of cash because there wasn't any cash anymore. Uh, small notes uh, are not really available. Uh, to get an idea, like 100 rupees is like 1 euro 20. So 1,000 rupees is 12 euros and there wasn't any thousanders, any 500ers more anymore. So uh, new notes slowly came out from November 10th onwards. Um, I was in India from November 15 onwards and for quite some time this new cash was nowhere to be seen in the wild. So um, it was quite funny. Um, but still, cash is the best we have and uh, to make that clear, we should use it wherever we can. And um, you should really do that because um, if... When I was looking for pictures of old and new rupees, by the way, Google showed me a lot of 500 euros. You know why? Because they also get deleted um, in 2025 or something. So um, it's very important that we still use the cash, but we also need a solution online. So um, as a technologist, I say, okay, then I just use Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin uh, is uh, something as crypto anarchists and hackers, we like it very much because it's an unregulated payment system. We find it as a feature that there is no regulation uh, and it's free software, it's decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, um, so very nice. <coughs> as a decentralized banking system, it requires to solve the Byzantine consensus where everybody agrees about transactions and therefore balances. So uh, Bitcoin solves that uh, problem um, that it ties the distribution of money and the creation of new nodes to solving this consensus problem on a ledger. Um, so you need to compute this uh, computational puzzle and then make the new transactions. I guess everyone knows about Bitcoin, right? And then the last node who finds the puzzle um, gets the reward of the mining fee. So it is very slow and it is very expensive. So um, that's screenshots from yesterday, bitcoin.info uh, charts. So this is the Bitcoin cost per transaction. Um, since I think it's not really readable, uh, the first part is May 2016, so it's, it's one year. And it goes up to um, 18 um, and starts by four. That's dollars. So um, here made a shot, uh, I guess it's also not readable, uh, the lowest amount, like the lowest transaction fee which was there, um, or transaction costs, it's not the fee. So the fee is actually really small. If you pay by Bitcoin, you just pay a few cents of fees. But that's the transaction costs for the whole system because the because of the rewards the miners get. Um, so that's the lowest amount you have, that's the highest amount, that's uh, $16, and um, that leads to the result that the uh, average transaction value is around $1,000. And uh, by the way, all the electrician costs and environmental costs are not calculated here. It's only the costs of the rewarding. So um, you know that you have to compute a lot, so it's also costing a lot of electricity. Um, so uh, it cannot really be used for doing groceries or buy your dinner or get a dress or something. Um, so it also not really solves it. Also, um, all Bitcoin transactions are public and linkable. There is no privacy, privacy guarantee. Um, there is stuff like Zerocoin, Cryptonoid, Node, Monero, Zero Cash, which is Zcash, who offer anonymity. Um, but then they are also enhanced with laundering services. So now, what is Knuck Taler? Taler is a payment system using existing banking infrastructure. You pay in existing currencies like euro, dollars, rupees, or Bitcoin. Um, it is like PASH, so you pay anonymously and you can sell with invoice and taxes. Um, it's convenient and fast. One-click web speed payments are possible. It's uh, free and open source. Uh, it's a GNU package. It uses established crypto and a protocol, an open protocol. Um, the crypto is based on blind signatures. It's a research project from academia uh, entering real world now. <laughs> 
Um, there is no black blockchain technology used. It's not based on the proof of work um, or any other distributed consensus mechanism. So how does it work? Like cash, I withdraw money from my exchange. I spend the coins and the merchant deposits the coins. Same way as cash. And uh, same way uh, the, the exchanges, which can be a bank, um, need to be verified by audits. So here's another few. Now you have the triangle at the bottom. So um, to make this happen, you need to have the old like banking infrastructure. So um, I pay money to my, to my bank, like I have money there. Uh, my bank makes a wire transfer to the exchange bank. The um, exchange bank is the one where I can withdraw coins. So now I possess coins. Now I can spend the coins at a merchant's place somewhere. And um, that merchant then deposits the coins at the exchange, where the exchange bank then makes a wire transfer to the merchant's bank. Right? So uh, that's the, the main architecture and the main concept. So how does that work? <laughs> Go to demo.tala.net, install a browser extension, visit the bank, demo and withdraw coins, and visit the shop to spend the coins. And this is something which uh, Torsten is going to show you um, afterwards. So this is how it looks at the back end. You have a little script checking if the wallet is installed or is it not installed. Um, if it's installed, the uh, 402 payment required gets triggered um, and leads to the, like the, the, um, the contract URL. And if not, you have a fallback of like saying, oh, you don't have Toller installed, so uh, you can use credit card systems. Um, then uh, this is the contract where you have all the information you might want, like uh, the currency and uh, very important, the red part uh, where it leads you once you paid the like fulfillment of the contract and also stuff like payment deadline, refunds deadline and stuff like that. So here's a comparison with other systems. So um, the credit card is the only one that really serves on and offline. So all the other systems are either online or offline. Um, as you see, GNU Tala only works online, but that's, I mean, that's the idea. We already have cash for offline, so we don't need Tala for offline payments. Um, yeah, so if you look at the section payer anonymity and payee anonymity, there you can see the major difference. So uh, of GNU Taler and like all the other systems, so that here the payer is anonymous and the payee is not. Um, yeah, and then I think the last line is also very important, the freedom. I mean, that's why we are here this weekend. <laughs> Um, here's another comparison where we uh, grabbed out those uh, four features, privacy, online payment, taxability, and licensing, um, and where Thaler fulfills all of them. So now into the, the views from the different perspectives. So as a private customer, I find it fast and convenient, um, and I like that I can send money to friends as well. As a traveler, I appreciate that there is no false positives in the fraud detection anymore and that I can get a proof of payment. As someone uh, who's losing her wallet in meat space occasionally, I'm looking forward to have backups of my wallet. <laughs> As a citizen of the internet, I know that such thing can only work if it's free and open and third parties can verify all the components. Um, as a hacker, I like that it's private, um, like cash, there's no personal information required, um, also no credit card details that need to go to the merchant. As a merchant, 
I again find it fast and convenient. I appreciate that there is no rejections of limited customers and that there are signed contracts. Especially, I'm happy that I don't have to store any customer information, which means I don't need security audits in my own infrastructure anymore. Um, uh, is it, it's uh, free and open, so I can integrate it very easy, and I have competitive pricing and support. And uh, Tyler is ethical, and uh, it complies with the upcoming data protection regulations. I also didn't know that. There is this regulation uh, starting May 2018, that's like one year from now, um, where uh, privacy by design and data minimization are required for all data processing. That's quite interesting. So uh, credit card payments won't work then anymore because they'll be illegal. Um, as a customer and merchant, I'm uh, like from both perspectives, uh, it's good that it's cheap. Um, it's an efficient protocol, there's no fraud, so um, they are competitive providers, so there are barely any costs. Um, that it's flexible, so I can use it for small amounts and I can uh, use it for any currency. Um, that it's stable, that means I don't have any fluctuation risks like in Bitcoin heavily, um, as in just as traditional currencies with the usual government protections for financial services. So if the rupee falls and I have rupee in cash with me, which I have right now, then it's like a general risk. Um, but not any different. And uh, it's very nice that it is efficient, so there's no waste of like energy and bandwidth, no inflationary costs for the whole economic system, like the mining costs. Um, and then it's good for all, both fast and convenient, safe and secure flaws, which I already had in the slides before. Um, if I would be a government, I would like that it's commons, so it preserves my independence, there's no monopoly. Um, I like that it's taxable, and uh, I like that it's efficient for the economy. Um, then I'm happy that it is secure and that it serves signed contracts and proof of payments, so in case of court stuff, there is uh, proof, um, and there is no counterfeit. Um, also, I'm happy that it's audited, and that there are no bad banks and no fraud and stuff like that. Uh, and then it's very nice for me as a government that uh, I'll be protected against foreign espionage. So fortunately, I'm not a government but a techie, so um, I'm happy that it's coming in GPL. Um, that's a Fero GPL for the exchange, L GPL, uh, which is uh, now for the reference code, demonstrating the integration with the merchant platforms. Um, and then there are licenses like Apache, Mozilla, GPL uh, for wallets and related customer-facing software, which can be anything, um, any license. Uh, then it's a RESTful protocol and uh, the security does not depend on the use of HTTPS, um, unless we're hoping that HTTPS will be there anyhow. And it's written in C, TypeScript and Python and uses Postgres as a database. So uh, now the more interesting part, the crypto. So Tala uses proven established crypto constructions like cryptographic hash functions, blind signatures, Schnorr signature, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, cut and choose zero knowledge proof, and of course modern installations are used. So um, here, I'll be just briefly going through it. Uh, you're very invited to ask questions, which Christian can reply then. <laughs> um, so the first step to do this is to set up the whole thing. So we need to pick an elliptic curve. Um, then the exchange creates a denomination key with RSA. Uh, the merchant creates a signing key, ED, DSA, and the customer creates a planchet. A planchet is ein Rohling. Um, this uh, is very close to the concept Chaum was creating. Uh, that's this guy who uh, started to do a digital cash in the early 90s. So the second part is to withdraw. So um, 
this is very much like Charm. So the customer uh, blinds the blanket, the exchange blinds the, s the sign, and uh, the customer unblinds to get the coin. So now the planchet gets a coin. So uh, this is uh, the uh, WC3, uh, W3C <laughs> um, uh, standard from the payment interest group. So I'm already way out of time, so I just skip that. So, but that's the the um, yeah standard uh, sc uh, scheme. So now the third part, the payment. So the customer builds the shopping cart, like clicks item items. Um, the merchant proposes the contract. Uh, the customer spends the coin. Uh, the merchant verifies the coin, and the exchange verifies the coin. So again, here is the whole process of the payment. So and now uh, the fourth part of this crypto protocol is about giving change. This is very heavy. So um, I think we all agree that it's unreasonable to have like hundreds of one cent coins to solve that problem. So um, we want to like have the merchant being able to give out change, um, which is unlinkable and which still gives the taxability of transaction. So the method is uh, that the contract can specify only to only pay partial value of a coin. So the exchange allows wallets to obtain unlinkable change for remaining coin value. So um, this is how it works. So the customer asks the exchange to convert an old coin to a new coin, like the rest coin, right? So the protocol ensures that new coins can be recovered from old coins, but new coins are owned by the same entity. So the, it needs to be refreshed. And this refresh protocol allows to give unlinkable change, to give refunds to an anonymous customer, and um, to expire old keys and migrate coins to the new ones. Um, also, transactions via refresh are equivalent to sharing a wallet. So I told you before, you can share your money. So anyhow, let's go through this very briefly. Um, this is the, the protocol again. So um, the owner of a new coin may differ from the uh, owner of the old coin. That's the problem. So we need a straw man solution. So Diffie-Hellman is used here. Um, then uh, the like transfer key setup starts. Then there is this cut and choose used. So the customer commits, the exchange chooses, the customer reveals, and uh, the exchange verifies. And then uh, you blind. Um, the, the change and unblind. So, and that's another brief view on the, um, the OPSEC. So, the two browsers um, communicate with each other and they communicate then with the Tala backend and the wallet. And this is very much disconnected from each other. So, that's the important part. So, if the browser is somehow uh, stupid, then the wallet isn't affected. So, but now for the last minutes, this uh, view as the futurologist. So, this is just a rough selection now of things that could be possible, and I'm very happy to discuss this as well. Um, so, when it comes to donation, sharing coins is always possible. So, it's impossible to stop donations, same way like cash. So any legal recipient will get the money. So it's impossible to create situations like PayPal was not paying to NGOs or WikiLeaks. Um, and as a side note, if it's not legal, there is also no way around it. Um, then it's also much easier for handicapped persons because they can use their own devices. So the whole thing like captchas on websites and the physical terminal thing um, is not an issue anymore. Then uh, I find it very interesting uh, that the coins expire. I haven't mentioned that before, but the coins will expire after a while. So then there is a fever for refreshing, and that creates a negative interest rate. So people might stop sitting on uh, like plenty of money. Um, 
then there's a transparent structure of fees, so um, fees, fees created by a particular payment system doesn't have to be paid by all customers, like we have right now. So usually if there's no fee when you pay with credit card, that means that everyone has to pay those fees, um, because they're distributed among everyone. Um, then also small merchants don't have the hassle with the credit cards. Um, I don't know if anyone is here who was with us when we started to do credit card payments for um, the Congress. This was quite a hassle. And we actually wanted to drop it in between very often because we just said, okay, let's screw it. This is just too much hassle. Um, so we made it then through the process. Once you have set it up, it's okay, but setting it up is, is uh, very, very hard. And also customers don't have to think about if they can trust small merchants. I think everyone knows this. Uh, you rather choose than another merchant uh, if that one which you just wanted to enter your credit card details somehow looks scary. Um, then you have machine-readable contracts which makes easier tax filings and made, might make flat tax obsolete. Um, it also makes the Swedish model of transparency of income tax statements possible um, much easier. Um, then the next point is multi-currencies and open standards, giving a way for uh, regional currencies and other alternative economies. Then uh, it is very transparent, it's open source, so anyone can understand it if he or she wants to. Then, uh, as I said, I'm losing my wallet in Meetspace sometimes, so I am responsible for my wallet, be it on or offline. And um, if it's online, I can back it up. If I lose my credit card, I always have a problem. Um, if someone steals my wallet, I can trace the coins the moment they are spent with the help of the exchange. Um, then you have stuff like rest restrictive coins, so I can give coins to my kids and make them uh, in a way that they can only be spent for stuff which is like for uh, non-adults. And uh, it's possible to have micropayments. So uh, that could be an alternative for, for captures that you just pay like uh, 0.0001 euro for, um, for visiting a website or for emailing someone. Um, then it's very nice for donations, like the whole micro payment like we have with Flatter and everything. And uh, we could even get rid of web apps that way. And that's the last one. Um, it's a reserve-based system, so you can only spend cash you actually have, like with your wallet. Um, and there are different wallets possible because it's open source. So um, there's an open question, which we are also a bit in discussion. The goal of, or one goal of credit cards is to push customers to spend more money. Cash in the opposite gives a better feeling about how much money is left. We all know this, I guess. Um, commercial wallets might follow the idea of credit cards, but floss wallets could serve the opposite. Um, but we have no clue how we could serve the opposite. I mean, how can you make a like online online payment system looking like like a wallet where you see, oh, I only have 20 euros left. So yeah, to go on, you can check out the demo. Um, you can check the docs um, and the API and the code. You can subscribe the mailing list. You can join the IRC channel on Freenode, you can uh, follow Tala on Twitter, and you can help us in any other way by just telling around. Um, you can give us feedback, um, and you can implement uh, Tala into your applications, which you can do on Sunday, 2 p.m., uh, here in this house, not in this room, I believe. Um, and establishing ex exchanges, that's the big thing uh, for this year. So, yeah, exactly 30 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yeah. Um, first of all, can you do something like uh, that you can put a certain transaction hold? So, for example, assume that I want to buy uh, a new smartphone with the system. And um, then I am agreeing to a certain price and I'm waiting for the shipment. And when the shipment doesn't arrive, is there any way for me to 
put the uh, transaction on hold or open a dispute or something like that? Or would that go like through third party so that we agree on a third party? I put the, give some money to a third party. I wait for the shipment. And uh, when it arrives, I release the funds. When it does not arrive, I open a dispute or something like that. Yeah. Maybe Christian directly. Uh, yeah, can quickly answer. You would want probably a third-party escrow service. It's not built into the protocol at this point. Um, what is built is this possibility of getting refunds. So if the escrow service agrees that, well, you didn't get your thing, you should get your money back, uh, the system can be used to give you your money back, even though you have not necessarily identified yourself. So the giving money back is there, but the escrow, you know, somebody has to uh, be trusted to evaluate, did he, is he eligible for getting the money back or not? And that has to be somebody else. It's not the payments of his provider. So if I were to implement this on my web shop, and my customer, my typical customer is somebody who is not tax savvy at all. Um, would this be feasible at this point? You want to answer? You, sit, sit, sit. <laughs> you will see later how a non tech savvy nine year old, uh, no, tech savvy nine year old, sorry, uh, can use the system. So I think usability wise, yes, once uh, we actually have a user base that can use it, which means having this exchange. And it's only for online transaction anyhow. So it's not for this like little shop owner who's selling beer and who would never touch a smartphone or something. It's for the one who already has a website. So and the integration is very easy. If I have a website uh, that sells something that's absolutely okay. not for a tech community like yeah. like Amazon or selling whiskey or an airline ticket or something. So could 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 a, an average citizen use the system today yeah, yeah. if they only have a credit card or a bank account or so like ideally it will be showing up so uh, if you click something on amazon then you also have the choice of using a credit card or using paypal or using whatever sofort überweisung or something um, so then you can also just use Teller if you have it installed and um, yeah the installation and the usage then is quite easy Anything else? Da. Uh, two questions. Do you have a list of acceptance points? Do you have a list of acceptance points where I can pay with Taler? And the second question is, are there any regulatory issues like money laundering law or something? So for the first question, uh, no, Taler is still this uh, academic research project entering real world, like, about to. Um, so at the moment we're looking for uh, exchanges. So um, what we need is at least one bank who can serve as the exchange point and then we can have uh, people actually using it. So um, so the question for the, uh, uh, the answer for the first question is no there is no list because there is nothing yet. And the second question you Christian? For the regulatory question, uh, we uh, talked to several bankers and risk management experts and anti-money laundering experts uh, and they have all told us that yes, this is not the system they would expect financial fraud to happen in. Yes, it should be compatible with AML and Know Your Customer regulations. Uh, so they do not see that there are problems fundamental with the system. There may be things like you have to, uh, uh, under existing EU regulation, limit the maximum amount that people can buy with it, so you can't buy a house with it. Uh, you may be limited to that. There may be uh, uh, jurisdictions where you have to impose a daily withdrawal limits, so you can't withdraw 10,000 uh, euros in cash in a day, uh, just like there are these kind of restrictions on ATMs these days. Um, but short of these monetary limitations of what the maximum amounts are you allowed to use the system for, there seems to be no problem. Any other questions? Um, regarding the idea that a credit card encourages you to spend more money since you have no idea how much is left. Um, so I think that's probably true for like 10 years ago. But uh, nowadays you can have the card directly linked to, uh, to your smartphone. So you could immediately see how much is left at the moment when you spend something. So um, do you think that's... And um, of course, uh, I think there's a second thing. So people are now talking about standardizing online banking again. And um, when you have like a standardized access to your bank account, you could easily have an open source app on your phone that tells you exactly how much 
how many euros and how many cents are left on your bank account yeah. each month. Yeah, it's more about the feeling, right? So, um, like, even if my if my like phone tells me how much balance is left on my credit card, it's still a different feeling if my wallet is just empty, right? I mean, I, I don't know, like for me at least it is. <laughs> Any other questions? Or comment? Um, maybe a comment. Um, I don't know if you followed the Flatter thing. They just recently got bought, I think, by this company who does Adblock Plus. And uh, maybe this is a nice window of time now to introduce another system because this Adblock Plus company, I think there is some distrust in the community. So maybe some people who used Flatter since now are looking for alternatives. So if you can offer some, maybe it's a good time now. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, I would say we go for the demo now. Do you want to maybe add your, like, plug your computer? Any other question? There was something? No? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So first step, I go to demo.tower.net. Um, you have it already. Skip the installation. Everyone knows how to install a plugin, every right? Know, everyone knows how to install a pro plugin, probably. Now, to withdraw coins into my wallet, I click on this um, bank um, thing. Then I select the amount of kudos to withdraw. Let's say 20. You should then, say that's then, your bank page where you have yeah. your bank account with yeah. your balance, right? Yeah, and then I click on select exchange provider. And then I click accept fees and withdraw. And then I have to answer a math question. Okay, and then voila. Easy to withdraw kudos. And now I go back to the... Um, Show your wallet balance. Uh, to the um, uh, page, to the starting page. As you can see, here, here they are in my wallet. Now, I'm gonna, uh, now I'm gonna go to the easy store where you can pay kudos for individual chapters of Richard Stallman's book, Free Software, Come a Free Society, which is also available uh, for free at the FSF. So here um, one can buy a, a chapter of the book by just clicking on it. If you already have it, you don't have to pay for it again. Just click confirm payment. And then here it is. The chapter that you paid for. Whoopsie. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Torsten. I'm not, I'm not the gun, Papa. I'm not the gun. You, forgot? you want to buy another one? <laughs> no. Wait. Can you show the wallet again? He wants to. Just click on the um, taller icon. And, and um, well, you can also go to the project donation website where you can show your uh, show respect to a software project of your so, uh, choice by giving them kudos. In parentheses, the current, um, the current money that, uh, the current uh, currency that Taller uses. Well, then one can choose for what phone. <laughs> then one can choose how many kudos and um, to which uh, 
project you want to um, donate it to, I'm just going to pick Gnutaro. Donate. Then just leave it leave it as taller. <laughs> Confirm payment. Okay, done. Okay. Any questions to the I hope that answers any questions about can non technical people use this? <laughs> if not sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much and see you around the next couple of days. <laughs>